on today's story beat. If you want to get into this business, no matter what department you want to get into, there's a gazillion other people who want that job. And some of them are perhaps better qualified than you. So you have to fight for really wanting it and believing in yourself and never giving up because there's a lot of times where you know where the chips are down and, and the rolls aren't coming in bills have to be paid and you suddenly there is doubt that creeps in it's not a healthy thing it's unfortunate but it happens so you have to believe in yourself and persevere against all odds and know that it's not an easy ride but it's it's a fulfilling one if you're fortunate enough to, to, to get a chance to get on the bike once in a while. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, you're likely already a fan of my guest today, the actor and best-selling author Carrie Elwes, who you surely know from his many starring roles in memorable popular films, including The Princess Bride, Lady Jane, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, Saw, Kiss the Girls, and The Cradle Will Rock, among dozens of others. Currently, Carrie is a co-lead alongside Michael Sheen and Natalie Emanuel in The Last Train to Christmas. He's slated to star alongside Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 7 for director Christopher McQuarrie. He's starring opposite Jason Statham in Guy Ritchie's next film, Five Eyes. He recently wrapped the Netflix feature, A Castle for Christmas, as well as The Unholy, which was produced by Sam Raimi, and the indie film bestsellers opposite Michael Caine. You also know Kerry from his numerous appearances on popular TV shows, including Psych, Stranger Things, Family Guy, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and The Art of More, among many others. Kerry's first memoir, As You Wish, Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess Bride, became a New York Times bestseller. If you haven't had the opportunity to read this outstanding book, I highly urge you to get yourself a copy. It's an incredibly fun read. I recently had the great privilege to moderate a Q&A with Carrie live on stage here in Pittsburgh after a sold out screening of The Princess Bride. For me, it was a truly great joy. And now to have him on Story Beat is an exceptionally big thrill because I've admired his work for quite some time. It's my honor to welcome the spectacularly talented Carrie Elwes to Story Beat today. Carrie, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, that's, that's really very kind of you. What a lovely introduction. Thank well, you. this is my great pleasure. It's a great privilege to have you on. So let's go back in time in your life a little bit. Okay. So you've been at this performance thing for quite some time now. I, I'm wondering yeah. how old were you when the stage bug first bit you? When did you first think to yourself, wow. Oh I gosh, you. I grew up in a single parent house household uh and uh, uh we had a black and white television set uh, i'm dating myself now uh <laughs> we only had two channels in england uh, both of them in black and white we didn't get color until 1967 so for the first uh you know five years of my life i was sort of watching things in black and white and right. uh i fell in love with the tv that became my my best friend and i started studying it and uh, watching people, mostly comedians, actually, um, Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan, Michael Palin, Terry Jones, all so, the Pythons. So the Goon, Sh the Goon Show and the Pythons. Goon Show and the Pythons. Well, the early Pythons was something called Do Not Adjust Your Set, which you can look, you can find it now, thanks to YouTube. And it was a very weird, it was a very abstract show that, that uh, Terry Jones and Palin were doing with the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that should tell you all you need to know about that show. <laughs> and um, I, as a kid, you can imagine seeing all this silliness uh, and seeing how much fun these people were having had an, an enormous impact on me. And uh, I thought to myself, I have to get inside that little box. Did you start imitating them? Were you making of your course, friends? Of course, I started practicing. I mean, as I think you, I've spoken to a lot of actors. Uh, and have shared their, their journey with me. And, and mm -hmm. many of them have similar stories about mimicking or practicing or emulating their, their heroes as kids. 
just to try and figure out what made them tick, yeah? We, we were, I was a class clown, you know, I was a okay. person in school, I would make people laugh. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Right, laughter is the greatest thing, it's a, it's a drug. Well, we know that from our little time together here in Pittsburgh, we got lots of laughs that night and it was a we, lot of fun. We did. So, so, all right, so did you have a sense back then that you wanted to be in the business for your whole career? Yes, very much so, and, um, but I had no idea how to accomplish it. It was just a, a distant pipe dream as a kid. You know, um, I read voraciously. A lot of these books traveled with me from from England. Right. And uh, so I tried to, uh, you know, I basically taught myself, self-taught. I went to, I did go to acting school. Um, I applied myself to my craft and, uh, you know, uh, I got my first audition, I think, when I was 20, 20 something. And um, a babe in the woods, a babe in the woods. And I, I got my first audition, which which spoiled me actually, because um, when I went up for my second audition, I thought, you know, this is easy. You know, <laughs> you know? And I walked in there and they were like, uh, thank you, we'll let you know. And I, I sort of, I think I said something like, are, are you sure? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was definitely um, a wake up call for me because I realized that it wasn't all just, you know, gravy and, and getting every role you wanted. You had to go out and fight for it. And, and oftentimes it was a pass. So um, so I want to ask you, it, at, was this after you had worked? Because I want to just explore for sure. two seconds. Sure. You're working on Octopussy. That's true. So my stepfather came along when I was about, um, about four years old. He came into my life and uh, he was a, a, a producer. He was the first American film producer to set up an independent film production company in England. Wow. And so suddenly I was that much closer to accomplishing my dream. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there was a man in my life. Uh, stepfather who had access to this industry that I was in already fallen in love with. So I felt like I, you know, it was like manna from heaven. And I thought this was, again, going to be very easy for me. But he actually gave me and my oldest brother some very sound advice. He said, look, if you want to get into this industry, if you want to get into this business, you have to start at the very bottom and you have to learn the ropes and get paid nothing. And it's the best film school you'll ever go to because you'll learn everything you need to know about making movies. And um, it's cheaper for me than sending you to some high priced film school. So that's what my brother and I did. We, we ended up becoming production assistants and, um, and he was right. It was the greatest education I could get. All right, so, so that's great. I, because a lot of the listeners of this show are trying to figure out how to yes. get into the business in some yes. way. Yes. What, did you, what do you think you picked up as a production assistant back then okay. that then held you in good stead for your entire career? Sure. Absolutely, very good question. So teamwork. You understand that the making of any show, whether TV or film, or even a play, is a concerted effort by a village. It's like, you know, they say it takes a village. Well, it is a village. Making mm -hmm. a film, making a project, making a show, is, it requires a village and everybody working together uh, uh, with intense focus. And um, that camaraderie that you get, being on a set together, forced together in a way uh, to be like a family, uh, a surrogate family for, for, you know, a few weeks is a very unique experience. But what you learn in terms of how a film is made, um, if you work in a production office or as a production assistant, you will learn every department. You'll figure out exactly how a film is put together and how every person involved in the film what their contribution is and how they fit into the big picture, as it were, right? And uh, and your place in it as well. And I, I found that to be the greatest uh, enjoyable thing. I got paid, I think, twenty pounds a week, which is about thirty dollars. You know, which just about covered my gas for my motorcycle to and from. Uh, but you didn't the, care at that age, did you? You don't care. You know, when you were a kid, you don't. You're 18, 15, 16, 17, whatever. You don't care. Uh, you're so excited to be doing something that is closer to accomplishing your goal in life that that uh, you you'll do anything. You know. So you get this gig on a big James Bond movie. Yes. And you, I understand from re reading about your yes. life that you um, actually drove around Roger Moore for a while. I did. Well, they, they couldn't get away with it today because there are very strict 
uh, union rules about uh, not allowing production assistance to work in transportation. The Transpo, obviously, a very very serious union, and 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 uh, you know, I, I I think I was one of the last people to get away with that uh, because today it's actually illegal. What uh, I, I'm curious, what you might have learned or picked up from him, who was so a, well, he, he was was obviously was the first actor I got to spend any quality time with, right? Uh, because I I you know it was I didn't talk much because he didn't really chat. He read the newspaper on the way to work every day. And drank his coffee, but occasionally he'd chat and say, you know, we'd talk about something, you know, the weather or the football or something like that. But he was so generous and so sweet and so personable and so real, and it was a great lesson for me in in how down to earth this larger than my figure was. I mean, after all, I'm driving James Bond to work, and don't forget, I I, I didn't have the call. I was driving to work on a motorcycle, I, and for for them to choose me to drive Bond to work was a terrifying prospect. I mean, I thought I was going to get in an accident on the freeway and I could see the headlines, you know, lowly production assistant kills Bond. It's a, it's a hell of a headline, you know? And I, I think I was driving really, really slowly. And I remember Roger lowered his newspaper and said, you can go a little faster if you want to, Carrie. Like that. <laughs> and um, I was petrified. I mean, I was literally white knuckling it all the way to the studio. Uh, and I think that was the only time I drove him. I think he was he was a bit frustrated that I was going so slowly. <laughs> All right, so so let's talk about your your process. You didn't go to film school. You didn't learn acting in a film school. No, but I did go to I did go to um uh to to theater school. So it, I did go to to you, that. Right. Okay. So you did learn acting properly. Correct. That is to yeah, say, in acting but, school. Yeah. But acting on film is a little different, isn't it? It's not. It is same. different. So I tra trained for the theater, but being on a set again, if you are lucky enough to spend time actually while they're shooting and get to observe how a film is shot, you learn about lenses and you learn about lighting and you learn about uh, presence and, and how to define your character on film and all of the things that you need to, to, to learn in terms of being an actor, how to dress, how to comport yourself, how to- How long, how long did it yeah. take you before you sort of thought you understood how it worked? Was it right away or did it take- It was pretty quick, you know, I was working in the production so I wasn't really allowed to go to the set much. I know I went one day and uh, I was asked to make a cup of tea and I was, it was so dark in the sound stage, I couldn't see anything. And I tripped over a giant, cable because they had big cables back then now they're very small and, and you, you can barely see them but I tripped over a giant cable and, and this this styrofoam cup left my hand and I saw it in slow motion as it tumbled towards this poor um wonderful actor who was playing her character's name was very inappropriate it's called Miss Goodhead and she was replacing Miss Moneypenny and and the costume designer was <laughs> sewing her her suit onto her it was one of those skin tight suits and I watched this cup in slow motion just pour tea all the way down oh. her wonderful uh, oh. Prince of Wales check suit. And the first AD turned to me and went, you, back to the production office. And that, and that was the last time I was allowed on the set. I, 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 I spilled tea on this poor lady. All right, so, oh, you, so you were learning how to be an actor on a set by being a production assistant. You well, I was learning from, from watching the actors, but I was also learning, again, being an actor in, in film requires understanding every aspect of, of, of the making of a, of a film, not just your own performance in it. You have to understand the politics and how a film is made and how to work with the crew and how to be one of the crew. I always find it very weird, especially working as a production assistant, that they refer to actors as talent. You know, what that suggests that the crew aren't talented. If so we're all talent and we're all crew. We're all working together to achieve, achieve the same goal. I, and, I, I um, totally agree with you. I always found that word a little bit. I awkward. know it had to be an agent or an actor who came up with that differentiation. Yes, okay. well, my, my client must be talented. Must so be by the time you get your first gig, you got yeah. your first audition and you got the role, right? Yes. Yes and no. I was going up for a play. I was, going, I was actually going up to join the Young Vic Theatre um, and I did a terrible audition there. And um, the director of the theatre took pity on me and said he, he had a friend who was casting a movie down the street and would I like to go and check it out? And I said, of course. And he called up his friend, Celestia Fox, who was casting this film called Another Country with Colin Firth and Rupert Everett. And I went over there and they gave me some pages to some sides to learn and told me to come back in half an hour and, and read them. And I did. And that was that. That was the first one that I got. Yeah. All right. So did you, once you 
when you got this part and you were yes. on set, did you have a feeling that you understood where your totally. place was? Totally. I was, it was the great, like I said, the comfort of walking onto a set and not have it be so intimidating as to be my first time on my first movie was an enormous uh, a relief for me. That didn't mean that my acting wasn't appalling and atrocious. And, and uh, you'd think that, that that comfort level of having been on a set numerous times would, would serve me well in front of the camera. It didn't. I was absolutely appalling. And um, I looked like a deer in the headlights. But anyway. I think we can safely say that you overcame that. Yes, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Yes. So let's talk about when you get a script and you have you you know you're doing the, the part. Mm. Yeah. Um, and aside from reading it, which is the obvious first thing you're going to do, uh. what is what is your approach? What are you what are you starting to think about when you have a role, you have the script? Where do you begin? How do you develop a character? OK, so first of all, I break down the script and and my character's role in the story. And, so what uh, does that mean by breakdown? What do you do? So breaking down the, the storyline and, and my character's uh, uh, role in that, in that journey and what their part is in that journey and, um, and how my character affects that story and how that story affects my character. And um, usually I contact the writer or the director and if it happens to be this one and the same, I contact them and I, I have a series of, of questions I won't get into, but uh, I have a basic list that I go through and, and uh, every director or every writer has been very, very immutable. And, and usually I've been very fortunate in working with people who are very diligent and very specific with their, with their work. So they don't find it hard to fill out my questionnaires at all. You go deeper into the characters. Oh yeah, no, I have to know what the characters, all aspects of the character nuances, you know, with the, their dreams, their hopes, their desires, their fears, their, their loves, their hates, their anxieties, their insecurities, all of it. It all plays into the wonderful soup that makes up a character, yeah? Do you feel like you are generating a lot of that information or is most of it coming through either the text itself or through your conversations with the director and the writer? All, all three. So hopefully the conversation with the director and the writer accomplishes that goal without my having to try and search for it. And it usually does. And once I have that character breakdown available to me, I can then apply it, go back through the script now and apply these nuances that, I've been, that have been shared with me and how they have, how perhaps, and quite a few I'm sure I missed, and how they play into the story line and, and, and the through line for the character. Do you, feel, do you feel like you work as hard today at that as you always Oh do? yeah, I'm harder now, I think, you know, uh, especially when you've, you know, perhaps gotten a bad review. Uh, there's nothing like a bad review to, to motivate you. That's true. And, uh, I, it, I got one, I won't mention it, but I got one and it, <laughs> I don't read them normally, but this one really motivated me. I'm like, you know what? I, I for the first time in my career, I decided to, not push an issue with, with regards to specificity to my character. And I let it slide and it cost me in the end. And it was a valuable lesson in not acquiescing to just give, giving in to pressure but because people didn't were too lazy and couldn't be bothered to, to, to do it. I, I blame myself. I shouldn't blame anyone else. I should have forced an issue where it would have helped my character. I see. Help my, my delivery and portrayal of that character. And I allowed it for the first time in my career to go, oh, well, I, I guess I can go without that particular detail. And it cost me. And, and I won't get into it. It's not, it's not important. But the important point of the lesson is the very little thing that you think is not important can end up being crucial. It, I think yeah. that's very valuable. That's extremely valuable because, yeah, yeah it is in the devil's in the details. In the detail. It, and nobody gets blamed. By the way, the, the person who said, ah, you don't need that, who was in the position of power to say that, he's not the one who's going to face the critics in the end of the day. <laughs> You know, so again, it's only screen. a mistake if you don't learn from it, is my motto. Absolutely. So now you've had the good fortune to be both leads in movies and yes. featured characters in movies yes. and yes. TV shows. Yes. Do you work at that process as hard if for both? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, even if it's a even if it's a lesser role in terms of oh, stuff, yeah, 
Absolutely. I did a cameo in this film with uh, Michael Caine last year. And literally, I think I had one, maybe two scenes in the whole movie. And uh, same approach, same thing. You know, uh, I played a, a book critic and I based him uh, specifically on someone I knew. And, uh, you know, I, I showed up in character and, and Mr. Caine didn't even know who I was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which was nice. That was nice. He was shocked. I shocked him. And and you didn't have like special makeup on or anything? No, no. I just had an earring and an accent and a different hairdo. And he wow. didn't recognize me at all. You're very clearly good at memorizing lines, which is part of your... Oh, I wish that were true. It's harder as you get older. But yeah, I, I have help. My wife is wonderful and has been my greatest support in terms of learning dialogue. So what do you do? How do you memorize lines? What I just you... I used to go over it. It's repetition. Brute force of stuffing them into your head. That's it. That's it. And finding word association and learning as much as the of the other person's dialogue too. That always helps if you can learn what else is being said by other people, because then you're really listening to it rather than just. Uh, so a allegedly Anthony Hopkins, you know, arguably one of the great. Learns everyone's lines. Learns everyone's lines. And he Everybody. reads a script at least 100 times and knows everyone's lines. It's incredible. And he has a memory that is that is phenomenal. And um, he's extraordinary. Look, I was fortunate enough, I went by his house in Wales when I was shooting in Swansea. And he grew up in a very modest little house, beautiful, really pretty. He's on a little street with little houses all in a row, semi-detached and detached houses in a row. And, uh, and it looks like out of a movie, you know, where it's a little street, all the houses look very similar, uh, very modest. And then right behind them is this beautiful, big green mountain. You know, green, and it looks like it looks like sort of nature stopped and then the city began. It's literally right behind the houses. It's, this is where the nature begins and the oh. you know the wild. It's extraordinary. Looks like sounds it's like it's out of a movie. It is out of a movie. So his view from his bedroom was on one side of the house, the factory, you know, was spewing all this toxins into the atmosphere, and the other view from the house is of this beautiful green hills and mountains. It's gorgeous. Wow. But he's a wonderful, wonderful actor. I don't know if you've seen The Father, but you, if you haven't, you should. His last performance, it's extraordinary. I have, I have not. It's on the list. You must it's watch it. It's, it's really, truly, and if you think you've seen everything that, that Tony's done, you haven't. Well, I, I, I have personal experience with Alzheimer's, and I definitely wish to see Oh, it. I'm sorry to hear but, that. Uh, th thank you. Uh, but but I'm saying I really want to see it. This yeah, no, it's a powerful, take. powerful film, and he's extraordinary in it. So really. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question that I ask lots of people, and it's not an easy question. For yeah. you, what makes a part or a movie good? Why do you do, aside from, you know, somebody's offered it to you and there's money involved and all the rest of mm -hmm. it, forget that. What makes something good to you? What attracts well, if, if the director and the writer are, 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 are completely in sync, uh, is number one. Number two, can the director tell a story? Mm. Is he able to tell a story? You can usually sit and have, over dinner and figure out that one. And more importantly, can he tell a story through film? Can he, does he understand the language of film? Because film is its own language. You know, acting is a language, lighting is a language, all, everything is a language, but film is a very specific language. How to generate uh, the emotions you wanna get out of your audience requires skill and understanding that. Name numerous filmmakers in history who've understood that, like Hitchcock, Kubrick. They understood what a single push-in can do or an angle from below can do, what that, how that affects you emotionally. And colors, well, you, colors in film, yeah. All you've of that. gotten to work with a few of those. Not Hitchcock oh, no. or Kubrick, but I have had some, I've been lucky, I've, I've worked with some wonderful directors who really understood the language of film well, and I really, yeah. Between Rob Reiner, Mel Brooks, Francis Ford Coppola, Ed yeah. Zwick, and Jan yeah. de Bont, that's a pretty good group. Pretty good, pretty good group. Yeah, no, I've been very fortunate. I have. And, and uh, I continue to try and seek out, like I said, filmmakers who, who are passionate and who understand the language of film and, and, and enjoy working with actors. So what, do you, what would you say really are my the three criteria, you know? What would you say are, the, are the, uh, the good lessons you've learned from the great directors you've worked with? Are there good lessons you've taken away from any of them? Oh God, yeah, many. We'll share a few. Well, Francis used to come up to us and occasionally he'd ask you, what's the character thinking right now? Hmm. Uh, which is a great note, you know, not, a, not, not, not one you often get. No, I worked as a, as a production assistant on One From The Heart. Oh, you did? 
So, How great was that? Wow, all on sound stages. All on sound stages, all wow. done with lots of steady cam and all Fabulous. the exteriors the great, Freddy all Forrest, the great Freddie Forrest and Nastasia Kinski and That's my dear old friend, Harry Dean Stanton. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, we all love Harry. Harry was a favorite of Francis, as you know. Um, it, it, indeed, and he he directed that movie mostly from the uh, from the Silver Stream. From the Silverfish. From the Silverfish. So that's correct. Yeah, no, I've learned a lot. I've learned you. I think you come away with something from every director that you work with. Uh, hopefully, if you're lucky, you work with somebody who really in, gives you a, a little bit more in terms of the knowledge to help you on your journey. And I found that to be true of all the directors I've worked with. And by the way, I've worked with some really great directors. I've worked with some pretty, pretty not so great directors. And I've learned as much from them, believe me, <laughs> without them saying anything, uh, as I have from the knowledge of, that's been passed on to me by, by wonderful. I've long, I've long believed that we learn as much from our mistakes, failures, not so great things as we do from right. successes. Oh, I mean, you have to. Otherwise, you'll keep making them. You know, like I said, it's only a mistake right. if you don't learn from it. So now you've yeah. gone through your prep, you've read the script, you've broken yes. it down, you've yes. done your research, you've done all your due diligence, and now mm -hmm. you're on a set. Mm. Do you have any particular special performance prep that you go through on a daily basis? No, I just review my notes and go over the scene. I, I used to be very methodical and overly sensitive and hang on to my notes like they were gold and, and be overly focused on minutia. And what I learned actually from a colleague of mine, a very talented one, uh, she gave an interview where she said, you know, I do all the downloading and I do all the research and I read all the books and I get all the notes and then I throw them away because I've already got it up here. And that was a great freeing thing for me as a young tormented actor coming out of England, like, I, you know, hanging on to my giant notebooks, like they were important. And they're not. If you've, if you've really studied them and if you've really downloaded them, they're in you. They, they're inside of you. And if you've really truly understood them and, and acknowledged what you've processed, then it's going to show up on film. Well, I, you know, I've taught screenwriting for 10 years. And uh, what I always tell my students is, okay, you've learned everything that we're going to teach you in this class. Right. Now, forget it all and just go right. Right. Because yeah, sure. it is in you. It's in you, right? It should be if you're paying attention. Yeah. Well, exactly. And of course, not all of them pay attention. No. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> to, me, to me, to go back to your question really quickly, is that the process is a constant education. You know, uh, there is, you know the day I, I think it was uh, Olivier once said, and I have his book over here that I brought with me as a kid. I read all, all the biographies of my favorite actors. He said, the day I think I know everything is the day I am, I'm going to quit. Oh, for sure. And, and you don't. So you're learning every day, every day. I, I learn from directors. I learn from the crew. I learn from other actors. I pick up on everything and I take it with me. Do you think of your approach as a learning approach all the time? Completely. It's a completely educational experience. And it's a wonderful one if you're open to it. I think that that's beyond wisdom. Uh, um, that if you can look at both life and your work as a constant journey and learning process, you're yes. in really good stead. Yeah, right, isn't it? I mean, I can't think of any other way to describe it. Uh, well, that's, I think that that's what it is. It's a, because some people think that they know everything. Oh, God. Who? But I've dealt with a few. Yeah. And yeah, once, that, once they've I, done that, I pity finished. them. I pity them. That's a very unfortunate place to be. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the difference between film and TV. Is there okay. a difference in, in, obviously you're going to approach a role the same, but same. is there a difference in the speed of it? Or speed. The... speed, it's good. You know, TV is good for not, not letting you have too much time to overthink things. I, I enjoyed television for that reason, because you really, they don't like you to sit around much. They, they really, it's a very fast process and, and very long hours and uh, very technical because they're trying to, and oftentimes you're uh, cross shooting. I forget the actual term for it, where you're uh, block shooting, block shooting where you're block doing, it, it happens to be the same set in this scene, but you're also, it's the same set for the next episode. So they'll block shoot you of, of a, another whole script that your character is going through and another journey that he's going through in another episode and try and shoot them both on the same day. So you have to really, really be focused, but it's, I find it very refreshing because I don't overthink it. I think that overthinking anything is, is the death of creativity. You can overthink something. And so, so I, I, yeah. I want to be clear for the listeners that what you're talking about in block shooting is, is, is a financial issue for a production right. where they've brought an actor in for a day or two or three or whatever it is. 
um, and they're shooting numerous episodes at the same time. Correct. And so they, it's a cost savings rather than having to bring the actor back time. And actually, again. I was not bringing brought back. I was there for the whole season, but it was actually so cheap that they wanted to save money by shoot block shooting different episodes <laughs> on the same set. That's all. But yes, it happens whether you're a day player or a weekly player or, or, or featured or, or recurring, whatever. It happens. How so, confusing can that be? Is it confusing? Well, like I said, you have to be, you know, you have to be focused anyway on, that, on every job. But this one requires some, you know, you have to have very good showrunners who really understand to help bring you out of that previous scene you shot and remind you of your journey in this next episode right, right. that you're taking so that the context within which you're doing the scene you know make makes sense yeah that's what I would think I would think you have to be really on your toes or you're going to yeah. wonder where you might be if you're not paying oh. attention you have I, I want to ask you about being game you're you have a reputation for being game and that is you've worked hurt we talked about it during the princess bride you worked with a broken toe yes. Uh, and so on. And you talk about that uh, quite a bit in, in As You Wish in your book, which again, I encourage people to get. But what is, do you have a secret? Do you have a way of philosophizing to work your way through something that's, you know, difficult or painful, or you've got a physical challenge that day? Yes, fear. <laughs> it's a great motivator. <laughs> <laughs> um, fear of being fired or fear of being sent home or any of the above. I, I think that um, I guess I come from the old English school of the show must go on, you know, unless it's a critical injury that that, that really requires the production to come to a halt. I think you can work through it. I, I've cut myself so many times, my fingers, my feet, my arms, everything. But broken toe, that was the one on Princess Bride where I thought they would shut the production down because that's quite serious. That was bad. That's pretty bad. But Rob was, I showed Rob that I could walk on it, which I shouldn't have done really. <laughs> <laughs> In hindsight was, was just a show of bravado at the time. And again, motivated by fear, but uh, yes, uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, I, you don't want to be the guy that brings production to a halt. Right. Close things down. Do you have to seek something inside aside from fear or is it pure fear? It's fear. It's, it's fear. a great motivator. And, 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 and putting it out of your mind and focusing, like I said, once you focus on the scene at hand, what you have to do, if you're fortunate enough, uh, everything else goes out of your head, except for those few moments that you're experiencing with another actor. And then you can shriek in pain after that. And then you can shriek in pain after. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna talk about directors. We talked about them a little bit, but I'm, I'm curious, when you're working with a director who may not be, helping you in any way, mm -hmm. or maybe giving you direction that you find either confusing or mm -hmm. just counter to what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, and you don't need to, I'm not looking for names or anything. I'm curious, do you have a way to work with the director to try to get out of them what you're trying to get out of them? Well, I always give, you always give the director what they want because it's their film and that's their story they want to tell. Um, if you feel that perhaps you can contribute more to that uh, aspect of the character that perhaps the director may not have seen or may have overlooked, I, I always ask them to give me one more take so I can show it to them. And uh, if they like it, then we, we explore that. But, but I never force my, my you, you, ne you never want to be that guy. Do you do things differently now than when you first started out? Do you approach the work differently? Well, like I said, other than holding on to my notes too dearly, and, and uh, now I just download them. Um, not really. I've, 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 I'm a kind of uh, a creature of habit, really. I kind of approach the material the same way. It's been my way of doing things, and it's worked well for me, so I have no reason to change it or, or modify it in any way. It's, it's so far, it's, it's, well, that's, good. well, that's a good, that's a perfectly great answer. Once you've found your rhythm and your yeah. way to do things, yeah. stick to it, you know? Yeah. We'll talk about voice acting for half a second, because you've okay. done a bit of voice acting. Okay. For animation. Sure. You find that to be a different approach in terms of the way that you're, you're the, the physicality of your voice is. Yes. Well, I've learned now that I need to bring more to that, actually. I've been studying what, when I, my, daughter was younger I obviously watch a lot more animated shows as a father and what I learned from the ones that she particularly liked I mean I was lucky to do Sophia the, Sophia the first and so that was a big thrill in our house for me to be on that show and mm -hmm. show it to my daughter but you know things when she watched a lot of the early Disney classics I looked at some of the work of some of these wonderful voiceover actors 
And I realized they brought so much to the role that the animators were given nothing but incredible amounts of matter to work with, yeah? Oh yeah. Character development in terms of their voice, how to make that voice speak volumes about the character because the, the look of the character is already predetermined by the animators, but can you breathe life into it in a way that is so unique and memorable? And I have to admit, I'm still learning that. That's a learning curve for me. Well, as you, as you know, I've, I've got 90 animation teleplay credits. I've written 90 cartoons. Good for and, you. and one of the things that is a hallmark of it is as a writer, you write your butt off and you do the best you can. And then you get into the recording booth and holy mackerel, the actors just take it to a whole other level. Yeah, yeah. Yes, hopefully I, I'll get a chance to do another and I can really explore something really extraordinary. I mean, I look back on those characters that all, Jungle Book, for instance, you mm -hmm. listen to all the different voices of Bagheera and, and, and Baloo and all of them are so specific that you, you believe them, yeah? Well, and yes. But there are also yeah. some incredible voiceover actors who do many, many, many different voices. Yeah. Oh, really? Like Mel Blanc, you mean? Like Mel Blanc, like Bill Farmer, um, uh, Maurice LaMarche. There, uh, Maurice, uh, is a, yeah, I, I'm good friends with him. And, uh, and he just does. He's amazing. He's you know, amazing. They're, they're, yeah. they're amazing people. Yeah. All right. I want to talk about sets for half a moment. Sets are notoriously distracting places. They're busy. There's a lot going on. Yes. Do you do anything particular to keep focus? I, I always like to arrive on the set early because then I get a chance to hang out and not being rushed. I don't like being rushed. Is and it I all about that. relaxation for you? Well, yeah, because I learned that from being uh, a production assistant that you that you can fix your call time any way, day, any time you want it. As long as the transfer have opened your trailer up, you can come in at any time after they've unlocked it. So I usually get in a minute. The minute they unlock it is when I want to be there. So I can just chill and take my time and ease my way into it as opposed to I, rushing is never good for anything you uh, know well no obviously i don't think it's good for like like it isn't good for anything at all no, but it's, especially not for acting no so you're a great believer in you must be relaxed in front of the camera yes it's all about being relaxed and having fun uh, you have to be in an atmosphere that's conducive to creativity and, and tension is the killer of creativity that is for sure. Do you do anything particular to, to be in? The I meditate. Um, uh, I relax. Sometimes I take a little nap. Um, I go over the scenes again that, that I have to shoot that day. But generally just just finding a way to relax before going into the work. Does that help you to remain as the as the actor's world is in the moment? Yes. Again, you have to be, you have to find that calm within you that allows you to literally relax, just completely not have any tension in your body whatsoever, because that shows up on film. The minute an actor is tense, everything goes out the window. Their breathing, their delivery, their performance, their, their, their whole character goes in and, the toilet. And paradoxically, that also is true when you're supposed to be playing tense. Well, exactly. I think well, you, everything has to be controlled and you have to have control over it. If you're not in control of the tension, of the fear, then you're not in control. It, it's as simple as that. You have to be in control of your body and your emotions and your state of mind. And uh, those will require whatever techniques you feel you need to get there, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody in the process. Yeah. So I think that one of the hallmarks of your work is that you have tremendous focus. You're, you, well, thank you. I, I mean, that's, I think all you got to do is watch several films of yours and you know this is a guy that knows how to focus. You focus whether you're in drama, you focus whether you're in comedy, you focus whether you're in a horror story, and you've done all these genres as well. Is there, is it just, you just find the character and that takes you there? That's it. If I'm lucky and that I'm a little bit blind, uh, I'm nearsighted, and people have offered me to go and get a corrective vision. And I, I've turned it down because I actually find that this, what other people would consider as a, as a uh, something as a dis disadvantage is actually an advantage to me. I can't see the crew. Really? I can see the actors, you know, in front of me, they're all in focus, but everybody beyond that, the crew, the camera, the light, I can't, I can't see them at all. Really? Is, yeah, it's fantastic. So when I walk into that set, I'm, the sense of place is there. The surrounding is there, the ambiance is there, the characters are all there, 
the set is there. And so I'm there for all intents and purposes. I am in the moment there, right there, as soon as they yell action. Because that's all you can see is this. That's all I can feel. I'm really there. It's great. Wow. Wow. It's really great. Yeah. Wow. And if you're lucky to work with other actors who are all into it too, it's a wonderful thing. When it works, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Well, no, no question. We, the audience, get to enjoy that. Yeah. And when it really works, it's really extraordinary. It's very special. It, well, truly. You, you clearly have played in many different genres. Do you have a preference for one or the other? Would you want to always do comedy for the rest of your life? If somebody no, said only- No, God, no. I, I mean, that's like asking someone if they want to have the same meal for the rest of their life. You, you could go crazy. Mm -hmm. No, the spice of life is to change your palate as much as you can, I think. It, it, it didn't help me in my career to begin with because people didn't want to see me in anything other than rom-coms, medieval you know, comedies and things like that. I was offered so many sword rolls after Princess Bride, you, you don't even know. And I just thought, you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to spread my wings. I want to try different things. I want to explore different things. My, my heroes are uh, growing up were Olivier and Burton and, and Ralph Richardson and, and Peter O'Toole and Peter Sellers, all these guys who disappeared into different characters, uh, Alec Guinness. And then of course, all the great American actors all the great character actors out of, you know, from, from Duval to Hoffman, all of them. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to go and, and study where they study, which is why I went to New York and worked. I got into the Lee Strasberg Institute and studied there. And um, I applied myself because I wanted to be like them. I wanted to learn like what Al Pacino would learn and what De Niro would learn and Hoffman and all those guys. So that's what I did. So, so let's talk for two seconds because we're, we're coming close to the end of the show. Yeah. I just want to talk about the notion of celebrity for a moment. Okay. And how, it's, and how it affects you and how it's handled. You have worked with some of the greatest actors of all time. No question. From Michael Caine to Billy Crystal to Andre the Giant to Tom Cruise um, to Denzel Washington. You know, you work with these Matthew Broderick, some of the greatest actors who've ever lived. What is it you think that's, that they have I know you can't buy it, you can't train for it. Is there something that you've identified over time that makes so, a, a, a great actor great? Yes, okay. yes. Picking roles that play to their strengths. Mm, that's simple. You see, there, if you if you built up a following, there's a reason for that following. And the reason for that following is that your fans want to see you in certain roles. Right. And I didn't apply that to my career. I actually <laughs> I didn't listen to that advice <laughs> until I learned from it much later on. I would submit you're being a little hard on yourself, but okay. Uh, no, I, I didn't. I tried every different kind of role. I mean, I played, I played Ted Bundy. You know, I mean, can you imagine the Princess Bride fans? Going, I don't want to see Wesley as Ted Bundy. That's what? <laughs> what are you doing? But I had to, you know, I had to try different things, yeah? But what I learned from uh, the great agent, Ed Lamato, who passed away a few years ago, a wonderful man who represented me at that one time, he said, you know, I make sure that when I get a script for Richard Gere, it plays to his strengths. I don't want to see him play a psycho. You know, I don't, I, you know, his fans want to see him play somebody slick and cool and smart. And, you know, uh, Denzel Washington, his fans want to see him be the underdog and win over the the, win the oh, day at the oh, end. but he's but he's played heavies he's done things yeah but he's done. also always the underdog he's always that guy who's maligned and then he gains gains your respect by the third act you know that well that's true julia so, roberts is the wallflower that no one realizes is the most beautiful woman in the room until the final day when the guy goes wow i haven't noticed you before you know and that's <laughs> that's her role that's her strength you know those are all her role runaway bride and pretty Pretty woman, they're all the same. Well, I guess that's true, but you don't want to, I mean, you can look at a Clint Eastwood as someone who has always played the same part, more or less. Pretty much. But um, then you can look at a Dustin Hoffman and see someone who's true. played a different part. True, there are, there are actors, exactly. There are character actors who I definitely, he's a, you know, somebody I definitely feel, feel a great uh, simpatico with. Hoffman was one of my favorites growing up, and Pacino too. They, they like to, to delve into the characters and explore them in ways that, that uh, you know, only a handful of actors do. And I really admire that. I really thought that was a fun thing to approach in my career. I, I don't know if it helped me because uh, I think it probably took me out of the running for some more important roles that might have helped my career. But it, for me personally, grat the gratification of getting to explore roles that I had to go fight for because people didn't see me in them, they were very gratifying for me because I accomplished my goal of being able to to do something that was 
not in my comfort zone. Well, uh, the, the fact that you fought for them says mountains about you. Thank you. Um, so last question for you today, Carrie, this has been so much fun for me. I don't, don't know Thank how you, you feel about it, but it's been fun for me. So you've given us lots and lots and lots of advice, but do you have one piece of advice that you like to give people when people come up to you, I assume every once in a while and say, you know, tell me how to do this or that. Do you have a solid piece of advice that you like to give to people? I do. I have a very solid piece of advice, Steve, and that is this. It's one word, perseverance, because uh, if you want to get into this business, no matter what department you want to get into, there's a gazillion other people who want that job and some of them are perhaps better qualified than you so you have to fight for really wanting it and believing in yourself and never giving up because there's a lot of times where you know where the chips are down and and the roles aren't coming in and bills have to be paid and you suddenly there is doubt uh, creeps in it's not a healthy thing it's unfortunate but it happens and um so you have to believe in yourself and persevere against all odds and know that, that you know, um, it's not an easy ride, but it's, it, it's a fulfilling one if you're fortunate enough to, to, to get a chance to get on the bike once in a while. Well, I can't think of a more, it's a, something that I tell people all the time. You, no one succeeds in the business if they give up. So perseverance is about as powerful a bit of advice as you could give to anyone. So I... I I totally you. concur and thank you for saying it because no, it, it's true, right? It then backs me up when I tell people. Well, it's true. I mean, you have to believe in yourself because if you don't believe in yourself, how are you going to convince other people to? No kidding. I mean, really. So, Carrie Ellis, this has been one of the great hours on Oh, Steve. thank you, Steve. I really appreciate that. I'm so appreciative of your time and I really, really love your career and I love thank everything you. about watching what you do. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me. I really had fun doing this. And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great story beat episodes to you. Story beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.